Welcome to the first message in our series, Fight for Faith, part one of our study of the life of David. Keep watching as we see how it's not always a good thing when God gives us what we ask for. Sometimes we need to take a break from telling God what we want and take time to listen, letting Him tell us what we need. As I mentioned, we're starting this series in the life of David, and, and out of all the studies that we could do, and when you look at the Bible, you know, the longest character study in the Bible, apart from Jesus and the Gospels, is the story of David. It's in the story we're going to look at in First and Second Samuel, and the re- recording of his life takes the whole second half of First Samuel, and then the whole book of Second Samuel. I mean, it's an incredibly long story. And then it's told again in Chronicles, so that we can look and see more things there. And, uh, and what you realize, you don't even need to be a Bible scholar or a student of the Bible even to know something about this man, David. I mean, he's somebody that is well-known outside of biblical literature. So, for example, all you do is you consider the nation of Israel. I mean, you look at the flag of the nation of Israel, and right there, it's the Star of David. That's their symbol, because he's considered the greatest leader of, of history of the Jewish people, and to this day, even their flag proclaims their heritage back to King David. Or you think about their, you know, the capital there, Jerusalem, and the capital, the city of Jerusalem, is referred to as the city of David. Throughout history, some of the greatest works of art in history are depictions of this character, David. So that we can go from Michelangelo and his famous sculpture depicting David when he was a young man, to numerous other famous sculptures to depict him later in life and, and showing him as this great king. Or countless pictures or paintings that again are considered masterpieces that show him at various stages of, of life. And this isn't something that's limited to ancient art. So we can go to contemporary art and we can look at the whole art with, when we're dealing with now especially films. And Hollywood has embraced this and made numerous movies over the decades depicting the story of David. Some of them big budget you know, movies featuring you know, huge stars. And, um, and, and numerous times, sometimes telling the whole life of David, sometimes just taking one part of his story and just telling that one part. Now, personally, I think one of the ultimate examples of this is that you know, one of the greatest movie makers of all, the makers of VeggieTales, you know, they, they've made not just one, but they've made two movies about David's life. And here you have David and the Giant Pickle. Now, you could probably guess who that's about, right? You know, David and Goliath and... and uh, And, you know, now they made this one first, and then you heard that they were going to make a movie about David and Bathsheba. And you think, how in the world do you make a movie about David and Bathsheba for young children featuring vegetables as the actors? And, uh, you know, and and so they did it and came out with, you know, King George and the rubber ducky, or the ducky. and, And the story even has the king spying on someone, taking a bath, and longingly looking at the duck and, uh, and longing for that duck. And so... Now, so when you look at this, you know, they're going to see these stories. It's a well-known character. And we're going to be looking at this. And at times, we're going to see some stories that we know very well. We know about David and Goliath. We've heard that. People outside of the culture know that. And sometimes we're going to see, because it's such a long story, that there are things in there that few of us ever, you know, could have ever imagined are part of his life story. So there's a lot there. But let me start by telling you some of why why I felt like God is calling us to study David at this point in time. And, um, you know, since coming to Community Church about eight and a half years ago, you know, one of the things that I've been committed to doing is to preach the whole counsel of God's will and and his word. And so so one of the things that I do, I think there's real tempting to get into one section of Scripture and fall in love with that and just stay there. And one of the things that I have done from the very beginning is that I've made it a, a, uh, a commitment on my part to try to preach through different sections. So not only you know, large sections or books of the Bible, but also that I'll start with a, you know, an epistle like the book of Colossians we did back a, you know, a year and a half ago. Or, and then after, after the epistle, I always go to a part of Jesus' life. And so we've just finished a study of the Sermon on the Mount where we're taking that from the Gospels. And then we'll always go to a section in the Old Testament, or in this case, what we're doing is we're now coming to the life of David. And so I was praying about, okay, now what section did I, from the Old Testament did I feel like God wanted us to deal with? And the more I struggled with it, the more I felt called to David. Part of me was really resistant, to be honest, because it's such a long story, it's such a big story, and I'm like, boy, do I want to make, you know, this is such a big commitment. Some of it's very difficult, and... But the more that I prayed about it, the more I just sensed that, 
you know, this is a guy that's worth studying because he's someone we can relate to. And the fact of the matter is there are times that, you know, you look at heroes and you're just like, man, they're so great, and I can't imagine, you know, and there are parts of David's life that you see aspects of his life where he was heroic. And the example of his heroic living should stimulate us and encourage us. You know, there are times that you see him being described in tremendous ways. I think of Acts chapter, Acts chapter 13. It says, uh, when it talks about David, and, and God describes him as a man after my own heart. Now, that's as good of a compliment as anyone could ever receive, that a man after God's own heart, if God were to say that about me, that would be great. And while David had some incredible successes, the fact of the matter is he also had some incredible failures. And that's part of what I can relate to him on. I can look at that and say, I can relate to someone who fails. I, fail to the, I relate to the failures more to the successes. And what you see with David is you see a, 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 um, a, a real man, a man that you see him described in the Bible, not in glorious terms, but in the reality of, at times, great success. And we say, what allowed him to succeed? But then also in tremendous failure. In fact, there are times that we're going to see this and you're like, how in the world would God describe him as a man after God's own heart when he did all the things that he did? And part of what we'll see is what set him apart even in the midst of some of those failures. And again, as I mentioned, you know, it is a very long story. It goes through, you know, the second half of 1 Samuel, all of 2 Samuel. And as I studied, studied and prepared, you know, one of the things that I'll do is I'll spend a lot of time just thinking about it, praying about it, outlining, you know, kind of outlining the messages that, that, uh, that we're going to do. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized that the story really is divided into two very distinct parts. So in 1 Samuel, it's everything from David being anointed king all the way until the point that Saul dies. And that story tells a very unique aspect of his life. And then we go to the second part in 2 Samuel, after he is made king, and we see in that story a very different aspect of, of the story of his life. So there are different themes in these two halves. And one of the things that we see in the first theme is that, you know, that you see that David is a great warrior. And he is, he's a tremendous warrior. We think him as a, as a warrior. But throughout the first half, we see that many of his battles weren't military. And even the ones that were military, when you look at David and Goliath, so you see, that wasn't about military battle. That was a battle of faith. It was an issue of belief and faith. And throughout, it's not just the military things. At times, you're seeing him battling stuff, stuff like, how do you believe in God when God doesn't seem to be there? How do you believe God's promises that God anointed him king and said he would be king when, when the king is trying to kill him? And when he's living in a desert by himself. And we see that in these battles, there were some that he was victorious and some that he was not. And as I thought and prayed about it, really the theme of the whole first hard part of his life is that of, of battles. And, and so we've decided to, to entitle the first section, the first half of the study, A Fight for Faith. That's what it is. It's a fight for faith. It's a story of how he's fighting for faith. And we're going to see this is all very applicable to our lives. Because the fact of the matter is, all of us are probably never going to be faced with a situation where we're faced with a nine-foot-plus giant and we have to face him in battle. That's unlikely to happen. But you know what? All of us will face enemies and crises and temptations that will challenge our faith and that will threaten to destroy us if we fail. And so we're going to see that there's a great deal that we can learn through this study. Now, the first three weeks, we're going to be looking at the events in 1 Samuel that are kind of predating David's life, and it's really talking about the guy that King Saul, the, the, the uh, king that was the first king of Israel. And, and we're going to see that this is necessary because Saul plays a major role in David's life, and so you've got to understand a little bit of the context and who Saul is to understand how it all plays out in David's life. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we're going to look at, at what uh, the, the Bible records about the, the selection of the first king of Israel. And, and as we go there, I want to, I'll start by saying this, you know, that as I, I look at this passage, this is one of those passages that it went a very different direction in my study that I thought it went. And, uh, and personally, I found it to be very convicting and very uncomfortable, you know, that I, I, I'm very privileged to study God's word and to be able to do this and spend the time that I do. And each week, 
You know, I spend time diving into God's word and looking at it and saying, God, I want you to teach me. And it's always enlightening. There's always things. I can say that every week I get up here and I will not get up here until I say that God showed me things that I had not seen before. I'm always learning new things. And the fact is it's always enlightening. And sometimes it's convicting and sometimes it's downright unpleasant. And that's a lot more what it's been over these last couple weeks because God has revealed things in my own life through this. He's revealed some failures that I've never really fully owned to the degree that I need to, and nor have I owned the consequences of some of those failures. And uh, and I'm going to share more of that. But this is this is very relevant material that we're talking about here. But to understand it, let's first of all take a minute. Let's look at some of the context, the historical and biblical context. The context is this, that we're talking about the people of Israel, the people of God, and they had been on a long, slow drift away from God. If we look throughout everything prior to this, what you see is that in Israel's history, their relationship with God was tightly linked to the quality of the leader that they had. So when they had a godly leader, that godly leader would lead them towards God and that the people would follow God and the, people, the nation would prosper. Although if they had a bad leader, what would happen is that they would drain or drift away from God. You see, the nation understood that, in a sense, God was their king. It was a, some people call it theocracy, that God was their king and God was their leader. He was the ultimate authority. And he exercised that, leader, that leadership by putting certain people into place, prophets and, and, uh, and judges, people that, in a sense, had the ability to hear from God, to speak from God, to represent God to the people. And again, when things were good, things, were, you know, things ran well. And right before David, there had been a prophet named Samuel. And early on in his life, Samuel had been a tremendous spokesman for God. He had been a great leader, and things went very well. But as, as he got older, what happened is that uh, he got older and he became less and less involved. And what the Bible tells us is that as he became older, he became less involved. He, he started to delegate more. And he started to give more to his sons. And the problem was is that they didn't share the character and integrity of the father. And the, and the nation began to suffer. So if you have your Bibles, look with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And look at verse 1. It says, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the firstborn son was Joel. And the second son, uh, Abijad, I can never say this word's name. They were judges in Bathsheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So the people became disillusioned. You know, they wanted something done about it. But instead of coming to Samuel and saying, Samuel, you know, these are not God's choices. We want godly judges. What they did is they said, Samuel, we want a king. We want to do away with this whole idea of prophets and judges that God has instituted. We want a king. It's not about having God as a king and someone represent God. No, we want a king instead. And if we look deeper, that's what we see is that it wasn't just about Samuel's sons. That, in a sense, was a pretext to something bigger. Look at verses 4 and 5. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel and, at Raham and, and said to him, Behold, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So he says there's three reasons. Okay, first of all, you're old. Okay, you've been a great leader, but you're not involved anymore. Number two, your sons don't walk in your ways, so they're, you know, they're bad leaders. And so what we want to do, the third of all, the answer is a king, and why? Because we want to be like all the other nations. You see, the call for a king, the, the pretext was, Saul, was Samuel's sons. But really what they wanted was a king, not because of Samuel's sons, but because, we're told, they want to be like all the other nations. They wanted a king like everyone else. They're in in essence saying, you know, we're tired of having an invisible God. You know, we have people from other countries come and they say, well, where's your king? You know, where's your palace? Where's your, because the king is the symbol of authority. The king is somebody who said, well, we have a great nation. Look at our king. And all we can do is we can say, well, look at our God. Well, you can't see our God, uh, but, but trust he's our God. And there's, no, we don't want something invisible. We want something visible that we can point to. We want a leader here on earth. We want to be like all the other nations. They all, they all have kings, and the great nations, boy, they have a great king, and they can point to him, and they can point to the palace, and that proves and demonstrates their power. That's what we want. And so you look at it, verse 7, and you see that, that God understood this. He understood that the whole thing with Samuel and his sons was a pretext. He understood that the real issue 
was that they didn't want God to be king. They wanted an earthly king. Look at verse 7. And so the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds they have done from, not, from the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, and so they are doing so to you. And here's what God's saying. He says, I understand that the real issue is that they're rejecting me. And when he says they're seeking out after other gods, what they're saying is, is they want to trust in something other than me. You know, they're saying we want to be able to put our trust in a leader that's going to make us look good, that's going to fight our battle, that we can see. And you know what? This whole idea of having God that we can't see and that we can't really tell him what he needs to do, well, that's bothering us. That's not working for us. And so what happens is that they demand this, and we're going to see is that by the end, God gives them the king that they demand. But we're going to also see very clearly in this passage that sometimes when we demand something from God, it's not always a good thing when God gives it to us. In fact, sometimes it's a, it's a tragedy when God gives us what we want. Sometimes, even in our own lives, there can be warning signs right in front of us, warnings that this may not be of God, that, that it may be a bad idea. There might be times that we're, we pray for something, we desire something, and God seems to close the door, but we don't give up, but we continue on, and we seek in, in, in pursuing that with you know, persistence, and we're not only telling, we're in a sense demanding, God, I need this, I need this, I need a king, I need this, I need this thing in my life. And sometimes God does close the door. Sometimes we pray, and we know what that's like, where we pray and we long for something, and God closes the door, and he says, no, he says, this isn't what's best for us, and that's hard to hear. But there are times in our life that God doesn't close the door. But the, he in time gives us what we want, what we're demanding. And when we look at this, we find that sometimes what he gives us, what we want the most deepest, is to our own detriment. It's something that doesn't answer the problems that we hope, but it causes a crisis. Now let's look at this as played out for Samuel, and then we see how it's applied to our life. Um, You know, we have to say, how does this happen? Why do we get caught up in this? And we see some of these ideas here that are very relevant because we do the same things. The first thing is what happened for them and what happens for us is that, is that we get caught up in the deceit of conformity to the world's perspective. And so you look at this, if you have your Bibles open, again, go to 1 first, uh, uh, first Samuel 8, look at verse 19. You know, we're told that, you know, they called out and said, we want a king like everyone else. And God warns them about why that's a bad idea. And he says, if you do that, he's going to tax you. He's going to take your sons off to battle. He's going to take people and make them your servants. He's going to, you know, it's a bad idea. And we look at what they say in verse 19. But the people refused to obey the verse of Samuel. And they said, no, there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all the other nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Now, why did they want a king? Number one, we want to be like all the other nations. You know, we don't think that we look good. We want to have somebody up there that represents us, that makes us, that gives us a good name. Number two, you know, we want a king that may judge us. Now, think about that. Who's been their judge up till now? You know, God has been. You know, God has been their judge. You see, but and, and when you look at this, it wasn't a rejection of, well, we don't like Samuel and your sons, because then it would have been, no, Samuel find a godly, godly judges, but they're saying we don't want, we don't, we don't like the system that we've had. And do you know why? When you think about it, is when God is the judge, they don't have a say. When God is the judge, God tells them this is right or wrong, and he doesn't take a vote about what they think. God isn't flexible as the culture changes. You know, God says this is truth, and it's truth over time, no matter what people said. And they wanted a king that basically had to listen to them. They wanted a king that lived in their culture and that would be able to to make rules and to judge in a way that was more understanding to the cultural times of their day. They wanted a king who would listen to their opinions as he made the rules. Don't we do the same thing? Lastly, they wanted a king who would go out and fight their battles. Now, if you remember anything about the history of Israel, God had been fighting their battles, and there were times that they would have battles that there was no chance that they could win. You know, they were held captive by the people, you know, by by Egypt, the most powerful kingdom of that day, and God won their freedom, won an incredible battle. 
They went against the city of Jericho, the most powerful walled city in that area of that culture. And God won that battle without them, you know, with just, without them you know, doing anything other than walking around the city and blowing a, t- a trumpet. But they wanted a king that they could see because the fact is they had a hard time trusting in a God they couldn't see. They wanted to be like all the other nations. Now what we have to realize here as we look at this, it's easy to look at this and to see that, uh, you know, well, well we, you know, we don't have that issue. You know, I, I, we don't, we're not calling for a king. But we make these same mistakes. See, one of the things we've got to understand when we understand this and try to study this part of Scripture, it's called historical narrative, these parts of the Bible that tell stories of people, is that we can't study and focus on just the specific actions that they're taking. We need to look at the underlying motive behind their actions. The specific action that they're focused in on is we're demanding a king. We're not going to deal with that. It's easy to say, well, that's not an issue for me, so this doesn't apply. But you know what? We've got to look at this and realize that it's not that they wanted a king. It's why they wanted a king. And we make the same mistakes that they did. It's just that we're asking or demanding different things. And one of the mistakes is that we listen to the world. They wanted a king because all the other nations had a king. All the other nations were saying, if you want to be successful, if you want to be respected, you have to have a king. And you know, we do the same thing. It's not about having a king, but there are other things that we look in the world, and the world is giving us messages about, well, if you want to be happy, this is what you need. This is what you need to have. This is what success looks like. You know, if you want to be respected, this is what you have to have. This is the path to fulfillment and contentment. And we look at the world around us and we say, you know, I want what they're having. I want that success. And boy, if that's what success looks like, well, God, I need that. And so we do the exact same thing. And what we have to realize is that there is some wisdom in the world's perspective. The people, the things that the world does, you know, yeah, it gives them you know, moments of joy. It gives them moments of happiness. There's wisdom. It looks like it makes sense to us. But that's what the writer of the Proverbs says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There's a way that seems right. It looks right. It makes sense. But the wisdom of man, the wisdom of the world, ultimately leads to our destruction. And what we need to realize is that we all live in a world that has a culture that has a certain kind of wisdom, that is telling us that certain things are right and certain things are things that we need. And we don't recognize that. Somebody, you know, people have talked about that the culture that we live in is almost like the water that a fish would live in. You know, people have said, you know, a fish, does a fish know that they're wet? No. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the air they breathe. That's the cult, that's where they swim. That's normal. And not only that, but you, when you're, you know, even we think of times that we're in the ocean, you're in the ocean, and you could be there, and, and you know, and then you look up, and, and you, know, you know, after a half hour, suddenly you realize, boy, you're, you know, you're a couple hundred yards down the ocean, or down the coast, and you've had a tide that has just kind of carried you without you realizing it. Same thing would happen with, it. they're swimming, they're just there, and they don't realize the impact of these tides, these impact of the, you know, these different currents that are tearing them along. And in the same way, we've got to realize we live in a culture and there are values in the culture. There are things that the culture says, well, this is true, this is wise, this is what you need, this is how you have to think. And you know, as Christians, it's hard for us to realize how deeply we're impacted by this because we're swimming in that water and we don't even know we're wet. And the only thing that we, our hope is to, realize, to, is to realize that there is impact of that culture and to battle against it. I love what Paul says about this in Romans 12. Look what he says. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Now, what do we have to be to do, do to be conformed to this world? Nothing. All we have to do to be conformed to the world is to do nothing, is to live in it and be unintentional and just let the world bombard us with its messages and its values. And next thing you know, we start thinking more and more like the world. He said, don't be conformed. And the way that we are not conformed is that we hate, take intentional action. And that is by, but we seek to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we don't just live in the world, but that we come and we say, okay, God, help me understand your word. Help me renew my mind. God, help me to think from a biblical perspective. God, I don't want to just go through life and just take all the messages the world thinks. I need to spend time in your word and say, God, give me perspective on how I should perceive things rightly. And how should I do that? When I'm renewed by the mind, then I will test 
and discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That means that we go through life and we start, we, God, this is what I need. This is what's true. This is, okay, God, help me test that. And just because it seems right and everybody around me says it's right, God, is it what you say is right? See, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and then test what we see and perceive in our culture by the truth of God's word, that is that that's what renewing of the mind looks like. So that's the first challenge, is that we are impacted by the culture without realizing it. The second is this, that we look at that and we, when we, then we come to God and we tell him what we need, and it's just that, we tell him. Then there's a danger of telling him what we need. Now you say, well, wait a second, aren't we supposed to tell God? Aren't we supposed to bring our request before God? Aren't we supposed to share and and, well, yes, we are in a sense. And the Bible, in numerous places, tell us to, you know, teach us to bring our request before God. I, I, one example, Philippians chapter 4 tells us this. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Let your request, let everything, every heart, every concern that you have, bring it all before God. We're supposed to tell God, in a sense. But this is the key. While we're to tell God everything that we need, it's in the sense of sharing our hearts. It mean, doesn't mean that we are to tell God what we need, meaning instructing him what he should do. And there's a world of a difference of sharing our hearts and God, well, let me instruct you what you need to know and what you need to do. You see, prayer must be a combination of sharing our hearts and listening to God's hearts. And that's not what happened here in 1 Samuel. Again, look, if you have your Bibles open, go back. Look at verse 9. The people, chapter 8, verse 9. The people all go to Samuel, and they say, God, we're demanding a king. God, we're demanding a king. And so look at God's response in verse 9. He tells Samuel, Now then, obey their voice, only that you will solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king uh, who shall reign over them. Now, I'm not going to read all these verses, but if you read verses 8, 10 through 18, what you find is that it's all warning. So for those nine verses, God gives warning after warning after warning. This is what's going to happen. These are the bad things that are going to happen. These are reasons you do not want to do it. You're going to regret it. And he concludes in verse 18 saying, and in this day you will cry out because of your king. You have chosen for yourself, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Basically, if you do this, you're going to regret it, and you're going to cry out, and you're going to say, God, redeem us, you know, save us from this. But that's your choice, and that's what you're going to get. But the people didn't want to hear what God was telling them. You see, they knew what God, they needed. They knew this is what we need. This is, we're going to be happy if we're going to prosper. This is the only way. And they came to God not to ask for wisdom. You see, they didn't come and say, Samuel, we're really struggling with this. Your sons aren't doing it. God, we need God's provision. What does God want to do? They said, God, we're not asking for wisdom. We're here to inform you. We're here to instruct you. We're here to tell you what you need to do. And we're not going to stop asking until you do what we demand. So now look at verse 19. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, there shall be a king over us, that we might be like all the nations, that our king might judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when I read that, I realize that I do this exact same thing. We all do. That we come before God, and we come and tell him what we need, not just in the sense of sharing our hearts, but sometimes we come and we're there to inform him about our needs. We're here to instruct him as what he should do. We're here to explain to him why this is the right thing. And often then, if God doesn't give us what we demand, then we get angry with him. God, you don't understand. I thought you were God. I thought you were, you know, I thought you were good. I thought you loved me. You failed me in some way. Because we see prayer oftentimes as something that is a demand of God that we know better and we're here to tell him to instruct him, to demand. We see prayer as a means to change God's mind, and what we miss is that prayer is primarily a means that God seeks to change our hearts. Now, to illustrate the difference of this, let me put it this way. The problem is that we approach God as a genie rather than our father. Now, think of it this way. When we understand, you know, this, you know, we think about a genie in Aladdin's lamp. What happens with Aladdin's lap? If you rub it the right way, genie's going to come out and he's got to fulfill the wishes. And, and that's often the time, the, the way that we approach God. God, well, how do I pray? How do, you, how do I say this right? Am I not believing enough? Have I not prayed the right way? Have I, you know, and God, how do I rub the lamp? Because if I do this, I expect you to, do, to answer. Now, is it a good thing to have an Aladdin's lamp? 
Let me ask this way. If you could give a five-year-old an Aladdin's lamp, would that be a good thing? No. Could you imagine what they'd ask for? I mean, it's just terrible. How about a 10-year-old? How about a 15-year-old? Would you want them to have Aladdin's lamp? Now, when we look back and say, okay, how about our, ourselves? We look at that and we say, well, I'm five, never, 10-year-old, you know, you know, but at my age, I can handle it. You know, the thing is that I can, we can all look back and we can look at our younger selves and we can say, you know, you know, boy, I knew at five years old, I didn't know anything. I was an idiot. And Ten-year-old, and, you know, depending on our age, it's how far back we go. You know, the, you know, I can look at that self in my 50s now and say, you know, boy, when I was 15, you know, I was an idiot. But um, when I was 25, I was an idiot. When I was 25, I thought I was an idiot at 15, but pretty smart at 25. And now I realize I was an idiot at 25 and, and you know, and... But, but now I think I'm pretty smart. And the fact is, the Bible teaches, no, you're always an idiot. <laughs> I mean, I say that in the most loving way. The fact is, is that we, we never really know. We never understand. We never have a right perspective and say, now I get it. Now I totally understand what's good and best for me. And one of the things that we understand with prayer is that we are called to come to God as Father, not genie here, let me instruct you, but let me come as father. And as I recognize that as I come to him as father, I recognize I'm the child and I need to be able to come before my father and submit to his wisdom. I'm not here to instruct him. I'm here to share my heart so that he can instruct me and then provide for me what he knows what is best for me. Now that's hard to do because what we do is that we look around and we're sure that we know now. You know, where some of this plays out, and I, I see it probably one of the most common places that people, you know, it's, it's often things that aren't bad, they're not sinful in themselves. You know, you have somebody, boy, I'm single and I want to get married, and, and, and so, you know, boy, I believe I need that to get married. Next thing you know, we're trying to make it happen, and we're trying to force it, and we're pursuing a relationship that might be harmful because we're sure that that's what we need to be, you know, to be happy. Or maybe you're married, and you're sure that, you, you know, this person needs to change. You need to get out of this to be happy, and and, and, you know, boy, I, here's my answer, and, you know, I find somebody else, or I seek divorce, or whatever it would be. There's all kinds of ways that we do this. You know, I need to move. I need to get this job. I need to get this raise. I need to have this, this thing. And so we have all these different things that we're sure that if we don't get this, that we will not be happy. So what we do is we tell God, we demand of God, and we try to find a way to make it happen. And sometimes God will give us what we demand of, and sometimes then we will come back years later, and we're like, man... I didn't have a clue what I was asking for. What we have to realize is that healthy prayer combines sharing of our heart and listening to God's heart. Yeah, it's telling God in a sense, sharing our heart, telling God what is, what is really important to us, but at the same time, it's listening to him. It's, it's coming to him humbly. It's letting him change our heart, recognizing that because he's father, he sees things that we don't see and and we shouldn't want to force him to do what we want. We should allow him to change us because that's what will satisfy us the most. The third thing is in this pa- we see in this passage is sometimes God does give us what we want even to our own detriment. And there's a danger in that. Remember, what did they want? Look at verse 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no, there shall be a king over us that we might be like all the other nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They said, this was what we wanted. God comes and says, it's a bad idea. Let me explain all the reasons why this is a bad idea or you re- regret it. Verse 22, you know, the, the, the Lord said to, you know, they said, no, we want it. Verse 22, the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. And so God says, okay, I'm going to give it what you want. I told you it's a bad idea. I'm going to give you what you want. Now, now look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 9. Continue on. We're told now here's the king that God chose for them. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was, uh, whose name was Kirsh, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of uh, Bechri, the son of a bunch of guys. Uh, he was a Benjamin, a man of wealth. He had a son whose name was Saul, handsome young, a handsome young man. There was not a man amongst the people of Israel more handsome than he. And from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now, they wanted an earthly leader. They wanted someone who would represent them well, someone who would be strong, someone who would lead them in battle. And God said, okay, let me find the best-looking, biggest guy. 
When he's not only handsome, that means he's well proportioned. And this guy is basically, everyone else comes to his shoulders. This guy is significantly taller than everyone else. This guy is the warrior. This guy is the leader. This is the guy that everybody's going to look at and say, man, that's, that's a leader. And God says, you want a king? I will give you exactly what you asked for. And he gives them the king that they asked for. Only we're going to see in the coming weeks that he looked good, but he didn't have the character to be the leader. He gave them exactly what they asked for but it was to their detriment. Now, you know, that happens for all of us. All of us can look back in life, and there were times that we pleaded for something, and God gave it, and it turned out to be something we regret. Now, let me ask you, why would God do that? Why would at times give us things that are our desires, even if they would harm us? And what we have to realize is that he does it for a reason. And the reason is that it's always to drive us back to him. It's to expose our need. It's to teach us our need of him and to drive us back to relationship with him. Now, you want a good example of that? Let me give you a great example. The ultimate example is the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son, when the son says, you know, give me my inheritance, there was every reason that the father would kick him out of the house. There was no reason that the son would do that or the father would give that. But you know what happened is that the father looked at that and said, this is a son I've already lost. He doesn't want to be here, and I want a relationship with him. So I'm going to give him what he wants. He wants his inheritance. I'm going to give it to him because I know he's going to go out, and it's going to make him miserable. And I hope that in his misery, he realizes how much that he's given up in a relationship with me, and it drives him back into that relationship with me. And God does that. God does that for all of us. There might be some people here that, you know, you have gotten what you want and you're living the life that you want and if you're honest, it's making you miserable. And God is saying, okay, I'm going to let you go there, but I'm not leaving you in that misery. It's an invitation to come back to me. When we make these decisions, it's an invitation for us to learn the ideas that God wants us to learn. When I, when I talked about this being difficult personally, it's because I see this so much clearly in my life and things that I hadn't seen that clearly before. And there are times that we had decisions. I think back of years ago, we were, um, you, know, uh, you know, I was working on my doctorate and we were looking for a, a full-time position and I was in some part-time positions. And, and I remember even talking to Sandy and Sandy's like, oh, I'm willing to go anywhere, but there were four places she didn't want to go. You know, she didn't want to go to uh, D- uh, Detroit. She didn't want to go to LA or New York City or south of the Palm Beach County border in Florida where we were in Palm Beach County, Florida. And, uh, and a church opened up and they offered me a position. It was you know, like 20 minutes south of the Palm Beach County line. And, and, you know, and we talked about it. We said, well, no. And I even said, well, what I'll do is I'm working on this. I'll commit to six months when I'm looking for another job. And, and I was really hesitant. And God just continued to push me towards that. And eventually we said, okay, that's where God wanted us to be. And those were some of the, the most blessed, happy times of our life, being where we didn't want to be. Because God's idea was a great, you know, I would say, you know, God's bad idea is a whole lot better than my good idea. But I think back of other times in our life that we were going, you know, had decisions. We had one time, we had a very specific decision. And, and we had a couple options. And one was kind of like the dream scenario of what we wanted. And it was exactly what we wanted. And we prayed about it. And we prayed. And, and we, you know, we prayed that God would, in retrospect, it wasn't really that God would lead us. We prayed that God would open the doors. And there were some very specific warnings that were there. But, you know, but we didn't want to see them. And it wasn't that any of those decisions were wrong, but the fact of the matter is that we persevered and we said, God, let me tell you what you need to do. Let me tell you what we want. Let me tell you. Let me explain why this is a good thing. And the fact is we persevered through that and we we made a decision and it was a bad decision. And there were very negative consequences. There were things that I think that God had put there that was warnings or that would have led different ways. And when I look at that, I see that there were negative consequences for our family. And and I look at that, and God has made me very aware, you know, that that I was wrong in that. That's Father's Day. We celebrate Father's Day and the role of spiritual leader in the home. And, And before God, I can say that I have tried to be the leader and husband that God has called me to be. But I have become aware that in that case, I failed my family. I failed to be the leader that God had called me to be. I'm, I, I'm willing to say it publicly. I've talked to you know, Sandy and said, I'm sorry, I failed. And I failed because I was focused on what I wanted. And I wasn't willing to listen to what God wanted. Now, the beautiful thing is that in the middle of this is that we can all look at those decisions, but there's some good news in that. And that is even when we make bad decisions, there are consequences for those decisions, but there's also redemption. There's power of God's redemptive grace. 
And so when we look at that, yes, God will at times let us live life by our wisdom. He will let us make our decisions and he will give us the things that we want, even to our own detriment. And we will do that. And even when we do, he will, there are consequences, but we're not forever doomed to that. The fact of that matter is, is that God is able to redeem even our mistakes, even times that we discounted him. I love Roman or Philippi, or Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Look what it says. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You see what it's saying? That God has given an inheritance, and this is what it is. He's predestined us so that he is working, all, he's got a purpose. And his purpose is working everything according to the counsel of his will. Everything, even my mistakes, even my failures. God is so great, so powerful, that he's able to turn everything to his good and grace and glory. He wants me to learn through that. You know, but the matter is if I'm able to learn, I'm able to surrender and take ownership of it, he said, okay, let me bring good out of it. We see it in David's life. They did the wrong thing. They said, this is the king. And God said, okay, I'll give you the king that I want. And they made a wrong move and there were terrible consequences, but the terrible consequences God redeemed and he gave them the king that they needed in the King David. That God was gracious and brought good even out of brokenness. I've seen that in my own life. And when I think about that own, my own story and how out of some hard things, God brought wonderful things and he blessed us in ways that we couldn't have imagined. And that God redeems it. And what I want to encourage you is that if you're here, that if you've made those mistakes, you're not stuck in those. You're not condemned to those. But willing to say, God, help me to see, help me to learn, help me to take ownership, and help me to see how you want to redeem and bring beauty even out of what my mistakes are. Bring beauty, you know, that, that, my, that my story of failure becomes your story of grace and glory because that's what God's grace does. And real quick, just a couple ideas of, of, of closing lessons of application. You know, understand that God... This, all the, the story of David, this historical narrative, it's all teaching through consequence. And so you see, they made bad decisions, bad, you know, there were negative consequences. It isn't that everything negative happens to us because of our sin. But the fact is, is when you look at the difference between David and Saul, what happened is that Saul made bad decisions, there were consequences, and he failed to learn. David made bad decisions, and as soon as he was confronted, he repented. My friends, we, we, you know, I can, I can relate to David because he failed greatly. And I hope that what we're going to learn through David's life is that when we fail greatly, if we repent, we surrender, and we let God teach us and can, uh, redeem us, that that's the mark of, of a heart after God. So we learn through that. All of us, we've got to understand that our culture impacts our thinking, that we are going to say, God, this is what everyone else has. But when we come to God in prayer because we realize that, let me challenge you to come to him and not just tell him what you need, but let it be a, a prayer of surrender. Saying, God, here's my heart. Now, now I not only want to convince you, I want you to convince me. I give you the right to change my desires. I give you the right to inform me. And realize that no matter where we're at, no matter the mistakes that you've made, that the whole story is one of God's grace and of forgiveness and redemption. No matter what mistakes you've made, you could sit there and you come to God today and say, God, I agree with you, I've messed up here. And you know what God's gonna say, I'll forgive you, and I'll give you grace, and I'll rise you up, and I'll even take the, the things that you're ashamed of, and I'll, learn, I'll teach you how to redeem those so that your story of failure, I will make a story of my glory. Are you willing to surrender that to him today? Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ or church, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. The links are in the description.